Yeah. Shook up as you are. To get to come to Sunday school, be um, around teaching God's work, and we are very blessed here at Bible Way to have a number of very, very good teachers, excellent Amen. teachers. Amen. Uh, Amen. Which Brother Linford is one. Amen. And he's, uh, he spends an awful lot of time in God's Word and prepares a lesson and just does such a wonderful job. And we do appreciate you. Amen. You are a blessing to the people of God and to God's work here at Bible. So you come, come ahead this time and uh, share what God's laid on your heart, sir. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate that message that he had this morning. Amen. Amen. Good man. Got a lot of good people in our church. Amen. Amen. I love my church. Amen. 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 And I'll be frank with you, I miss you whenever I'm not here. Amen. Amen. You really do. You're, you're, you're just good people. You're, you're just the kind of people I like. <laughs> common people. You know? It's just common, everyday people that whenever you get down, they'll be there for you. Amen. Amen. That's the kind of people I like. Amen. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 11 and 2 Chronicles chapter 9. We just got back from, uh, seemed like around the world tour, including Chicago, and then Warren came over and got us, and we went to South Bend and stayed there a couple of days, and then we got a rental car and drove all the way over to New York and stayed with Jonathan and them for a few days, and uh, then flew back to Nashville and drove in from Nashville. So it seems like around the world, but we enjoy it. I got my batteries recharged with my grandkids. Well, there's something else. First Kings chapter 11, 2 Chronicles chapter number 9. A lot of the material I got in this lesson is from a preacher by the name of Stephen Davey. Stephen Davey. I enjoy uh, reading and a lot of the messages and things that he has, and I'm going to give credit where credit's due. I think I'm just smart, okay? <laughs> Private Joseph Lockhart and Lieutenant Kermit Tyler, they were on duty at the radar station, and it was these two men, really just one of those two men, that were going to make the final decision among a series that would ensure a certain disaster. Seems like Private Lockhart was just about to go off duty whenever he saw the characteristic blip of an airplane begin to move across his radar screen. He watched as more than 50 of these blips started across his radar view. Being a good soldier that he was, he reported what he saw to Lieutenant Tyler, who assumed that the blips were American airplanes arriving back from maneuvers off the coast of California. Lieutenant Tyler told Private Lockhart, don't worry about it. And then he went off to Instead of calling his superior, Major Kenneth Bedquist, to confirm his assumption as normal procedure would have dictated, he and his men went off duty. Of course, we know the rest of the story. We haven't guessed it already. It was a simple fact that those blips. They were not American airplanes, they were Japanese bombers on their way to uh, kill thousands of Americans in uh, Pearl Harbor and sink a lot of costly ships and uh, put us in the bad way. How would you like to spend the rest of your life with that on your conscience, living in regret? He lived 96 now, in fairness to him, from what I read, he was new on the uh, radar station there, along with the private. Both of them were new on the job. So it wasn't like it was purposely done. It was just a little bit of neglect there. 
if only. Well, there's another man in the Word of God that had ample opportunities to read the radar screen of his heart correctly. But instead, he ended his reign as king over Israel like a beautiful ship breaking apart and just sinking into disgrace. Before we get to the positive, uh, uh, before we get to the downward uh, spiral of Solomon's life, let's look at some of his achievements. Second Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 22. And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and of raiment and harness and spices and horses and mules Arrayed year by year. I mean, Solomon had it all. He had wealth, he had splendor, he had fame, he had adoration, he had a powerful, united kingdom. He was living it up. The wisest, the richest, the greatest king on earth. Can you imagine that? Living life to the fullest. Every Adventure of possibility. Amen? I mean, every desire is met from racing stands to collecting wild animals. Everybody is coming to see you to get advice from you because God had given him so much wisdom. Solomon tried it all. In Solomon's day, there was nothing he could not try or nothing that he could not have. The world by the tail. Oscar Wilde in the most fitting epitaph of Solomon. He said, In this world, there are only two tragedies. One is not getting what one wants, and the other is getting it. So, how is it possible? For the wisest man on the planet, the richest man on the planet, to really end up as a failure. The downward spiral of Solomon, listen to me, it sends a warning to us. Amen? First Corinthians chapter 10 lists for us in the first 10 verses. We won't take, take time to read it. But it lists for us the major failings of the children of Israel from the time that they left Egypt. And then in verses 6 and verse 11, Paul summarizes the importance of learning from the mistakes of others. For example, in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, Paul said, now these things, what things? The things that are listed as failures by the children of Israel in verses 1 through 5 of that chapter. These things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And then you go down to verse 11. He again says, now all these things Happen unto them, the children of Israel, for examples, and they are written for our admonition, for our learning. Learn by other people's mistakes. Amen. So, as we examine more closely the steps that, that Solomon made in his a downward spiral, we got to learn from the mistakes of others. I only got one whipping in my life as a kid. You know why? Because I watched my daddy tear up my brothers. And I said, I don't want nothing like that. I don't want nothing like that. I'm serious. <laughs> Jim, you know what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, I didn't want none of that stuff. 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. And just look at verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. 
Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely, what's going to happen? They will surely turn your heart after their gods. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that was pretty plain. That don't take a whole lot of smarts to understand Solomon don't associate with these women. Right? By the way, there's another warning crystal clear from God to the New Testament Christian. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Oh, I'll change it. No, they'll change you. Right. Look at verse 2 again. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 2, the latter part of it. God said, For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And be like as parents telling our children, and we've probably done it. Listen, if you touch the eye on that stove, you're going to get burned. It's hot. Don't touch it. Have you ever done it? Maybe not stove or something else. Don't do it. Look at what Solomon, his attitude was in regard to God's plain, clear warning. Look at the latter part of verse 2. Solomon claimed unto these, in reference to these women, in love. So it wasn't me he claimed unto these women in love. One commentator put it this way. He flaunted it. He not only embraced them, he embraced them publicly. He not only married them, he courted them in front of the people of Israel, whom he was the king over, if you think about it. The foreign women coming in with their idolatrous and cultural polytheism brought with them enough seduction to turn Solomon off spiritually. The radar screen of Solomon's heart was signaling warning, warning, warning. Solomon not only ignored those warnings, he brazenly Rejected them. There's a pilot who flew an F 4 fighter jet. I thought about your dad this morning. He was a pilot. He flew an F 4 fighter jet on nearly 200 combat missions in the Vietnam War with the United States Air Force. And he told of the serious challenge of flying night missions. He said that at night, as you can well understand, the sky is dark. There's no discernible horizon out there to, to gauge yourself by. So therefore he said it's possible to enter what he said was a state of vertigo. That is when because of the loss of visual ability, the mind becomes disoriented as to which direction is up or which direction is down, or which way is this way or that way. And you know, you're just all turned around. And he said the challenge of flying at night in order to avoid vertigo's strange effects is to constantly obey the instrument. Even when the body and the mind is trying to tell you something different, look at the instrument panel. Folks, I think you know where I'm getting. When we become involved in sin, We all. When we become involved in 
sin, we enter, it's, it's like a, a spiritual vertigo. In other words, it's a state where our bodies and our brains are justifying, are rationalizing our behavior. We're flying in the darkness of sin. We're thinking everything is all right. Cool. Have a time in our life. But the fact is, we are hurtling toward a terrible flesh. Even Solomon himself wrote in Proverbs 14 12, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof of their are the ways. We need to constantly pay close attention. This thing just keeps. We need to constantly pay close attention to our spiritual instrument panel. Amen. Amen. Word of God. Because it is the Word of God combined with the Spirit of God inside of every believer in Christ. Second Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by God by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, for training in righteousness. But Solomon he bracingly, foolishly disregarded the instrument panel. He was ignoring God's Plain warnings. Look at 1 Kings 11, 2 again. The latter part of verse 2, Solomon claimed unto. He held fast to these in love. Solomon was basically telling the Lord, the Lord, I love women. I love my women. I love my wife. Life's never been better. He was telling God that by his response. Right. Verse 3. Oh, he had 700 wives. I got one. <laughs> We've already heard from her. <laughs> 700 wives were princesses. 300 concubines. Look at verse 3 again. And his wives turned away his heart. Blue, blue, blue. Danger, 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 danger times a thousand. All right, look at 1 Kings chapter 11 again. Look at verse 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old. And his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. You say, well, wait a minute, I thought David sinned with Bathsheba, had, a, uh, had a Bathsheba's husband killed out there in the wilderness. He sinned terribly. But you know what he did? He repented. He repented. God put him behind, but still sins behind. Amen. Look at verse 7. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moab, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Likewise did he for all his strange wives, let's don't leave nobody out, which burned incense and sacrificed unto their God. And you know, just reading that, it don't sound too terrible. But look at verse 7 again. I mean, when I explain this to you, you're going to say, well, He built a high place for Moab, the abomination of the children.
belly was an open flame. And the fire that would stoke in his belly and the entire statue would be glowing red hot with heat. His arms were fashioned outward. And into those red hot arms, the people would come and lay their babies in. Their small children in those arms. And the screams of those helpless little children screaming out. To the Ammonites in their minds that will satisfy their God. They were thinking, they think they're terrible. How could Solomon? I mean, he was tutored by Nathan the prophet. He built the temple of God. He had great wisdom given to him by God himself. He pinned down the books of Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. How could Solomon fall so far away from God by stooping so low as to honor such either practices? What happened to him? Well, we got a little clue from his own personal diary in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 2, chapter 4, 5, 6, and 8 says, Solomon said, I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. I made me pools of water. I gathered me also silver and gold. You see, Solomon's all wrapped up in himself. That's what we do. When we start disobeying God, we get wrapped up in ourselves. What's best for us? See, when Solomon was young, he was dedicated to the Lord. And then it seems like when he became middle-aged, he started being dedicate, dedicated to himself. And then as he became aged, he started being dedicated to other gods. It's interesting that in the listing of his building projects in the book of Ecclesiastes, he never mentions whatever body considers to be his crowning achievement. In other words, the building of the temple of God. He never mentions it. And here's something else that's interesting. It took Solomon, according to 1 Kings 6.38, it took Solomon seven years to build the beautiful temple of God. According to 1 Kings 7 1, he took 13 years to build his own personal palace. Put more time into it than he did the temple of God. And now old Solomon, King Solomon, has grown into an empty old man who looks around his kingdom, he looks at his harem of women, and all of his possessions. His power, everything, he looks back on it. All that. All that. And no exceptions. Nothing good came out of it. How many people have you known as believers in Christ? They fall into sin. You can't find them with a search warrant. They're out there living it up. C.H. McIntosh wrote a century ago in his commentary, Genesis Notes. Many a vessel has sailed out of harbor in gallant style with all its canvas spread. Amid cheering and shouting, and with the many a promise of a first great passage. But alas, storms, waves. Quicksands have changed the aspect of things. 
through some lessons to be learned by all of us, I include myself. Any generation of any age from Solomon's story, we never fall into a life of sin without ample warning from God. He makes it crystal clear what we're doing wrong.
Congress made him a footnote figure in a day that, according to President Franklin D. Roosevelt, was a day that shall live in infamy for America. And these four words followed him for the rest of his entire life of 96 years. Don't worry about it. Those were the words that Lieutenant Kermit Tyler said to Private Joseph Lockhart when he was told about the large amount of blips on his radar screen. Don't worry about it. If only Lieutenant Tyler had not assumed that they were American bombers, but had taken the time to pick up the phone, call Major Bedquist, and report it instead of ignoring the blips on the screen. History might have been changed. If only Solomon had read the blips of God's warning signals across his spiritual radar screen sooner and repented instead of having an attitude at least of